Kelly, I'm kind of disappointed you didn't mail all the participants cheese curds. Had to, had, to, had to locate my unmute button there. Uh, yeah, um, I, I've, been, I've been thinking all day long how to go about virtually sharing some. Um, I haven't come up with a good way yet. Uh, maybe maybe they could start. Uh, maybe you could, in, uh, 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 Michael. Maybe you can include these in your uh, Arduino package that you send out, and then include like lab package. snacks, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, after well, all, the labs only last as long as those things do. So. Right. Well, the cheese curds won't last very long. For those who don't know, I live smack dab in the middle of Cheese Curds Central, Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'm like surrounded by cheese factories all over the place here. <laughs> well, with that, everybody, that, that, that was not planned, but that's as good a uh, start as any. I want to get started. I've got a couple of uh, events to announce and a couple of other announcements before we get to session number three. Uh, so um, I presume you're all looking at a slide. Hopefully that's the case. Uh, welcome. I want to extend a warm welcome to the Pickup Virtual Conference and uh, thank you all for coming out to what should prove to be an informational and enlightening session. Uh, it is of course sponsored by the Pickup. Uh, that stands for the Partner for Integration of Computation and Under Undergraduate Physics. Uh, if you're new to Pickup, I would point you to the uh, web site that's indicated right here. Uh, www.gopickup.org, right? You can find out all about it. Or another possibility, you can see a list of people there. We like to intimately call this list the Pickup Leadership Council. Um, anybody on that list would be absolutely happy to respond to an email if you had any questions or anything uh, regarding our attempts to uh, positively impact the undergraduate physics curriculum across the Fruited Plain, right? Um, uh, running the show tonight are two people on that list in blue. I've highlighted in blue. I'm the fourth one on the list, Kelly Roos. I'm from a little place in Peoria, Illinois called Bradley University. I will be playing your host for tonight, uh, although unless something uh, uh, goes wrong, you probably won't be hearing from me after I hand it off to our moderator. Um, so, uh, well, uh, by the way, if, if something does go wrong, I'm going to come back on and entertain you with some Broadway numbers while we get it sorted out, right? But that is very unlikely to happen because of the third person on the list, Larry Engelhart from Francis Marion University. Larry is playing the role of our producer, and in his capable hands, we should not experience any technical difficulties. All right, so uh, before we get to the session, a couple uh, events I want to announce. Um, you can get to these on the Pickup website under the Events tab. And not just these two, which are, uh, the dates are set, but we, we keep that Events tab uh, updated. And throughout uh, the regular semesters, we have uh, uh, usually bi-monthly webinars. And so that's something you want to keep, keep uh, uh, abreast of. All right, so the first one is a virtual workshop we're doing in a couple weeks. And I want to warn you all that this really is, and I hate to use the word beginners or novices, but it, it really is for those who have never integrated uh, computational activities into physics courses. So it's gonna be very simple. And the vast majority of you I can see uh, probably would, would be quite bored for this. So however, uh, talk to maybe faculty, fellow faculty who would be interested in, or maybe skeptical faculty about uh, educational innovation. Uh, it's gonna be very basic, very uh, uh, simple emphasis on some how to do it and how to get you use some simple tools. The other one is a virtual uh, hackathon on GlowScript. This is put on by uh, Bruce uh, Sherwood. Uh, it is not, please take note, it's not how to use GlowScript and how to integrate GlowScript activities into courses. It's actually getting under the hood and developing and improving GlowScript.org, therefore, for programmers and developers. So you need extensive experience in some object-oriented language uh, to actually participate. Again, you can see all that under go, gopickup.org under events. All right, um, so this is session uh, three. And here's what we've come up for asking questions. So please take note, I'm gonna run through this very quickly. 
uh, this is just what we've decided to use. Use the Q&A button, right? And if you really want your question answered, do the like it in, the, in that window, right? Uh, presenters, just so you're aware, uh, the idea is eight minutes followed by two minutes of questions. Uh, if you get to the eight minute point and you haven't stopped, you'll receive a verbal nudge from God uh, to, to, to finish it up, all right? Please be aware, everybody who has participated, we have a conference survey that's going to be sent out by Alexis Knob. She's one of our faithful pick uppers. So when that arrives, uh, please take time to provide some feedback for us. And finally, FYI, we had 158 attendees in sessions one and two on Friday. And also these sessions will be recorded. So just so you know, one more thing to show before I hand it off to Daniel, you can get to all the videos of the presentations from Friday, and you can also download all the slides. You can get to this from the, uh, the uh, conference website. All right, so I'm gonna now stop sharing and I'm gonna hand it off to Daniel Guerrero from uh, out west at Willamette College. Daniel, it's all yours. Okay, uh, thanks Kelly and thanks for to the Alpha Leadership, or sorry, Pickup Leadership for inviting me to moderate this session. Freudian, oh, Freudian yeah. slip. <laughs> we have uh, a couple, or we have several uh, interesting speakers today. Uh, and so just to get us going on time, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Sarnil Oprasan from College of Charleston. Uh, who teaches all across the physics curriculum uh, and uh, whose research involves computational neuroscience uh, and who will be uh, talking to us about how to use MATLAB for signal and image processing tasks. So go ahead, turn. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so do, do, uh, how do I do this? I share the screen, right? Uh, let me see if I can share it. Correct. Just a little green icon at the bottom. Uh, it says that host disabled attendees screen oh. sharing. Uh, Larry, that's a you, I think. Uh, just click, there's a little arrow next to the share screen button. Just say uh, multiple hosts can share screens. Or Thank you. Questions. Thank you, Daniel. Good. <laughs> okay. So without further ado, okay. uh, sir, now you should be able to share. Wonderful. All right. Thank All you. Right. Now we see I your desktop, can... but not your Okay. Slides. Wonderful. Now let me find my presentation right there. Uh, let's start it. Okay. So let's go back at the beginning. All right, so thank you for um, allowing me to present to this wonderful uh, meeting. It's not the first time I'm uh, attending, but it's the first time I'm presenting. Um, so um, I um, would like to talk about a few things that we've done during the uh, spring semester um, to kind of uh, mitigate the disaster for uh, the uh, digital signal image processing class. Uh, because of the uh, end of the semester under COVID. So um, um, I'm going to skip the, uh, the abstract which was posted there and I'm going directly into uh, what is that we, uh, we have is a class on um, signal and image processing. We meet three uh, times per, uh, per week, three hours per week for lecture and three hours for lab. Um, the prerequisites for the class are pretty basic is, as you notice, uh, it's just uh, intro, uh, two semesters of intro physics. Um, so um, the um, textbooks I've been using for this class um, are mostly um, from Semlov and uh, also some of the um, codes that are uh, posted oops, that are posted in uh, the uh, textbook from uh, Blinovska. Uh, for uh, more theoretically oriented students and for some uh, heavy calculations, um, Z transforms or Fourier transforms, I use Oppenheim. All right, so what is we do briefly? What is we do uh, for lectures? Uh, mostly for the uh, um, signal part, which kind of covers half of the semester. Um, we start 
with digitization, quantization, and we discuss autocorrelation, convolution, Fourier transforms, and so forth. Uh, and we kind of end up um, at uh, filter designs. And usually we cover uh, in-depth uh, finite uh, impulse response filters and a little bit of infinite impulse response uh, non-causal filters. And then uh, the second part of the semester, we usually move uh, to image processing. Uh, in addition to uh, kind of going over the same concepts uh, from the signal processing side, uh, like convolutions and, and Fourier transforms, again, uh, for, for two-dimensional signals, um, we also discuss some more specific details on image classes and formats and color models and so forth. And some specific things about uh, convolution not like sliding operators convolution, but also uh, block operations on images, um, mask operations, and uh, logical and arithmetic operators. Um, we do a, a fair amount of histogram equalization uh, and image enhancement. Um, and we close the semester with uh, special transforms um, and image registration for uh, medical, biomedical applications. So that's basically what uh, we do in the lecture. And to give you a, a, a brief idea uh, of how uh, much we go in depth with the, uh, the, the, the theory during the lecture, the three hour lectures, uh, I pulled from, the, um, um, from, the pre from my um, uh, lecture slides, uh, briefly, not, I'm not going to lecture on, on those slides, I just want to show you uh, it's a different background, so that you know that is this is put from a, from lecture slides. Um, a brief section on power spectrum, and you you will notice that we basically go quickly over the theory of the power spectrum, either introduced with the autocorrelation function um, and the symmetry uh, involved in autocorrelation that simplifies a little bit the calculation of the power spectrum but also um, define the power spectrum with the uh, help of the uh, Fourier transform, which they learned by that time. And that's pretty much uh, the end of the theory for the power spectrum. And then we, we go during the lecture in class together um, over some examples. Uh, and, and in this particular case for the power spectrum, uh, I picked up an example for uh, heart rate variability. And the reason, uh, I, I picked up this kind of example is because um, in, in this particular biomedical application, uh, they deal with, uh, with data that are not evenly spaced in time. So they need to learn about, for instance, uh, the uh, interpolation function from MATLAB. So they need to resample uh, the, the data and um, then do the power spectrum. And also the other thing they need to remember, this is about variability, which basically means they need to do a first order difference, um, apply a first order uh, difference operator on their data. And then I, I give them, uh, I, I show them the, uh, the code that you see the, here, and I, I discuss with them step by step why we're doing this, why uh, is the, um, uh, an interpolation uh, function, why you need to do that, um, why you need to use the uh, differential operator there uh, to uh, calculate the, um, uh, the variability. And then we go back straight to uh, power spectrum, just calculate the Fourier transform, take the absolute value squared, and that's pretty much it, and plot it. And then we discuss the results. And here are the results um, for uh, two uh, different data sets on heart rate variability, the left side, is uh, normal conditions and the uh, right side is under meditation, somebody uh, doing some kind of uh, relaxing there. All right, so, um, and that's how much uh, math and how much programming is involved. The code is provided to students. And then we move to the section, the lab section, where the students actually have to um, do, um, um, projects by themselves and uh, on the signal side uh, we do projects on signal detrending and uh, modeling of residuals and so forth. On the uh, 
on the uh, two-dimensional um, signals, the image side, we do um, convolutions again, edge detection, as you see on, on the uh, left side image there, um, applied for one particular project, denoising again, histogram equalization, and all this uh, kind of uh, projects. And these are individual projects. Now, uh, the um, interesting thing is that um, the first part of the semester we were in class and we were able to actually do the um, uh, the one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings and discuss the projects. Um, during the second part of the semester, we were forced uh, basically to work remotely and that's when um, the MATLAB online uh, came uh, handy. And I want to show you, this is a recording of uh, an activity that I've done prior to this meeting so that you have uh, the layout that we used in class on the, this is a single screen and on my screen, you'll see on the uh, right side, uh, user number one, which is my local computer. Um, and and um, I also connected remotely through VPN to another user account um, so that I can see another user um, what is doing with MATLAB. So, so sorry, no, you're at eight minutes, so if you could wrap okay. up sooner rather than later. All right. So uh, basically, I, I'm, I just used um, uh, MATLAB online and transferred uh, my code from uh, the uh, MATLAB drive uh, directly, shared that directly with my students, and that's how uh, they had access to uh, the labs and I could actually see what they are doing, how they progress through the projects. And that's basically um, the, uh, the essence of that. So usually I, I share that uh, by inviting them. Uh, you could provide a link, but uh, that's how I've done it, uh, by inviting the members to join uh, my shared folder for different projects, three emails, um, and then they just link it. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. So we have time for maybe a couple of questions. If people have questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A tool, not in the chat. Okay, well, people type up their questions. I had a question, so you said about the projects. Uh, it was on a slide that said lab, and then the other stuff was sort of lecture. Are students doing projects throughout the semester or just like one big project at the end? Um, so the, the students do a project every, uh, they have to return a project every uh, two weeks. Uh, these are short projects. There is one big project at midterm um, that they selected probably at least a month. Uh, that's what they advised them, at least a month in advance to midterm. And then there is a final project that they select um, for the end of the semester. Also, that's another big project. But the the other projects you saw there, they are smaller projects that they can um, return in. Uh, okay, towards. excellent. The, excellent. Cool. So thanks for the really nice talk. Uh, and I'm sure if people have questions, they can ask them in the panel session at the, after uh, all our speakers have given their presentations. So our next speaker for this session is Jay Wang of the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, uh, who will be telling us about uh, numerical techniques for uh, quantum scattering. Uh, Jay. Jay, you're muted. Yep. Gets you every get, gets That's us every time, okay. right? <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thanks. All right. Okay. Well, glad to be with all the uh, pickuppers again. Um, uh, I lead off on one of two quantum talks now. Um, I want to talk about scattering. Uh, scattering is really important, uh, but it's challenging, you know. To realize it's the importance, all you have to do is think about why the sky is blue or the uh, Rutherford scattering. And it's really physics rich. You, you look at, you know, continuum, asymptotic behavior, and all that wonderful stuff. But the threshold required to understand that is rather high, the mathematical, you know, uh, background. So I found that in teaching my quantum class, I can use computation to help break down the barrier somewhat. And it makes the uh, scattering accessible and lets students, you know, uh, explore uh, some concept like phase shift 
and even real observable effects. So uh, furthermore, I think you can assign this as a project um, or a synchronous class work. So I, I, for the first time I'm thinking this fall, I might just forego the usual traditional final and you instead use a project-based uh, final uh, instead. So um, I will talk about uh, the numerical scale, uh, partial wave analysis with numerous methods. And I will use Yukawa potential as an example. And this talk, by the way, is uh, available at the pickup site even now. Okay? So the starting point in nutshell for scattering is you start with the uh, Schrodinger equation, the radial Schrodinger equation. It's effective one dimensional Schrodinger equation we are all familiar with, with the effective potential, the scaled wave function. And so the picture for scattering is that you come in with plane wave and scatters into some spherical wave with attenuation factor f theta. f theta is the important thing. It's called scattering amplitude. So it's made up of you know, um, many uh, partial waves uh, with phase shift del L and the Legendre polynomial. Now, the phase shift can be uh, extracted like this, okay? This is evaluated as some matching radius A and uh, involving uh, spherical Bessel functions is J's and N's. And of course, the wave function, the gamma factor, the ratio of this. So we're gonna compute numerically this wave function. And once we have that, we'll have this uh, scattering amplitude and we'll have our wave uh, cross section. So that's the idea, okay? So numerically, what do we do? Uh, uh, we use numerous method. Um, it applies to second order differential equations. First, the derivative doesn't appear. And with clever cancellation, you can find a three term recursion for the wave function and for the derivative. You see the order is fairly high. A standard three point interpolation gives you OH squared, okay? So the advantage of a numerous method is that you get both at the same time, the wave function and the derivative at the same time at, with a rather high accuracy. So now you just start iterating, okay? So wave function is zero at origin, and then you can set arbitrary value at the first grid point and you just iterate on. And you make this algorithm, put this algorithm in a function numeral. Of, all you have to do is you supply the function Q, starting conditions, uh, and number of steps you want to go. In the end, you get out, you know, the width. Okay. So what we need is we need a spherical Bessel functions as well. So we get that from psi pi, depending on the version. The naming is a little different. Okay. So this is a Yukawa potential uh, some of you may be familiar with. So uh, you have this factor that's like Coulomb potential. So you have the screening factor, S is screening length. Okay? So we put that into the function as well. And of course, Q. Okay? And this is a workhorse. You just tell it how many steps you want to take and where you want to match the, uh, the wave function. And then it just returns this wave function and the gamma factor here, okay? This doesn't look like gamma, but this is a gamma factor here. So let's take a look at this Yukawa uh, uh, potential. So you see that um, uh, this is uh, plotted here for a, a normal uh, screening length and for a large screening length. So the larger the S, the more Coulomb line. So you see the Coulomb potential is long range as well. Now. Whereas for the Yukawa potential is fairly short range, easy to deal with, okay? So the computation, uh, this is all. So we set up the re matching radius, the um, number of uh, you know, steps. You set the maximum uh, angle momentum, a partial wave, and with the energy. So here, the results I'm going to show is with energy two, okay? It's intermediate energy. So we calculate the spherical Bessel functions, for, of course. This loop is all there is, really. So for each partial wave, we calculate the wave function, the phase shift, once we have phase shift, then we can calculate the cross section down here, okay? So uh, this code is available, the talk is available, so you can take a look at this, you know, if you're interested later on. So let's take a look at results. First of all, this is the wave function, okay? So we see the wave function oscillates, it is plotted for three partial waves, zero, two, and four. You see that the zero um, partial wave, wave function is sub substantial at the um, near the origin. So the effect should be greatest on the lower partial waves. And that is brought out by this phase shift, okay? 
So the phase shift as a function of L, you see that decreases as we would expect. And the phase shift is positive for, for uh, negative potential as we, we know. Now to get a better idea of this, we can actually compare this wave function with a field-free wave function that is zero potential, which is plotted in the dashed line. So what you see here is that the oscillation is faster uh, because the potential negative, you have higher kinetic energy, right? So when you are further out, then it peaks early because of faster oscillation, and the difference here is the phase shift. You notice the phase shift is actually uh, progressively smaller for larger, you know, uh, portion. Okay. So um, now let's take a look at cross section here. This is pretty typical, right? Cross section is larger at forward scattering, but smaller at 180 degrees. So this is at intermediate energy. So let's take a look what this will look like at, say, lower energy. Okay. So let me back up here. Do the computation again. So now what I want to do is I want to look at uh, energy that's 10 times smaller, 0.2. Okay. Let's do the computation. And so what does wave function look like? Let's refresh it. And what you see is that wave function is, is pushed out further. And the S wave here is, in fact, uh, has the largest effect as we would expect. Okay. So let's uh, look at uh, this again, see if that is indeed true. Um, indeed, right? You look at the, uh, the uh, phase shift here. Basically, other than S wave, the rest is not. Okay, so let's take a look cross section here. Refresh this. And what do you see? So, cross section is inverted. It's larger at 180 degrees, smaller is the forward angle. This is very unusual. Classically, you do not get this. What's more, you have this minimum here, and this you do not get classically at, as well. And this well known the Ramsar or Townsend effect. So it has to do with electron scattering and lower energies. It's experimentally observed. It's non-classical, it's due to the interference of the few you know, partial waves here. So students can actually explore this um, and figure out the reason why. Real experimentally observable effect. So wrapping up, um, you can uh, see that uh, numerical methods really makes um, scattering, um, you know, exploration with numerical methods uh, really easy. And uh, you have a lot of, uh, you know, um, you, you, you can enrich your class that way and the student get to get a feel for phase shift and even investigate, you know, real effects like Ramsar or so like I said, I plan for the first time this fall, I'm going to use uh, probably a project-based final rather than, you know, the um, uh, problem-based final. Uh, we expect to finish by Thanksgiving and a couple of weeks after that, uh, wrapping things up. So I think I, I might just do that, do project-based. So you can do some other stuff, you like, you know, how the fuzzy sphere. And uh, let me end this by showing you uh, scattering uh, from hot sphere at different energies, okay, from low to intermediate to high. What you notice is that at low energy, the scattering is rather. So, Jay, we're a little bit over time. Uh, I thought you had your summary really slide up. So oh, okay. I say anything. So, this is it, yeah. Um, but maybe you can tell us about this during the panel discussion. Uh, so, there oh, is absolutely. a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one's pretty easy. Uh, so, have you written this up in one of your pickup exercise sets or faculty oh, comments? No, no, I've not done that. Um, Okay, so we'll be on the lookout I'll for think that. about that, yeah. Uh, and then another question was, are there any other applications of numerous method that might be useful for yes. an undergraduate you can, class? Yes, you can use this on bound states as well. You know, bound states, um, you don't even need the first derivative usually, yes. Okay. Um, okay, I have one question for you uh, that's just kind of a little bit technical. Uh, so uh, your presentation is pretty slick. What what kind of, what software are you using to do that where you have the like? Oh, Python I learned design? this from uh, Larry. Uh, this is actually a notebook, uh, Jupyter Notebook with a plugin called Rise, okay? Called what? So it's a slideshow basically. Uh, you What's can the plugin called? The, uh, a source code I put up uh, after my talk, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, cool. So we just finished right on time. Uh, excellent. So our next speaker uh, is Michael Olson uh, from uh, St. Norbert College. Uh, and he'll be telling us about some quantum mechanics exercises that he's been doing with his students. And I, as I understand, you actually have some of your students that are going to talk about their projects. Yes. Excellent. Cool. We're excited for that.
Um, so okay. just a quick a quick reminder to Larry that I'll need to have uh, uh, both Cullen Voss and uh, Tyler Bennett promoted uh, in the next couple of minutes so that they can uh, jump in. I'll cue them in at some point here. Okay, so to begin with this, um, all right, so this is essentially my report from last summer's conference. This is uh, my literally my very first attempt to bring computational exercises in a meaningful way into my upper level quantum mechanics course here at St. Norbert. Um, uh, just for those of you who don't know St. Norbert, we're, uh, as many of you were a very small program, three faculty, about, about two dozen majors. Uh, we do not have room for a standalone computational physics course. So we've initiated a department-wide initiative to integrate uh, computation throughout the physics curriculum. We've been basically starting in the upper level. It is now moving down into introductory courses as well. Um, the course in particular that I've, I've uh, been working with is quantum mechanics. It's our junior senior introduction to quantum theory. It's a 400 level course. Uh, I've taught this thing for tw uh, 20 years in a rotating basis, but historically there hasn't been any computation or if there has, it's been extremely minimal, uh, maybe some Excel plotting to do, to do a graphical solution to a transcendental equation or something like that. So this is literally the first implementation of a significant integrated computational segment into the course. Uh, one of the limitations is uh, prior to Kelly taking me under his wing last July, um, I literally had no experience whatsoever with Python. I'm an old Fortran 90 programmer from back in the day. So I had to sort of uh, adapt my game uh, to, to this. Um, for me, it, a lot of, for me, pedagogically, a lot of it was about blending. Um, this, uh, I, use, I use Griffiths, now Griffiths and Schroeder, classic text in third edition. Uh, the addition of Schroeder as a second author has brought in a significant number of computational exercises. Uh, for me, the theoretical on-ramp for this was the eigenvalue eigenvector problem that comes in about chapter three, just before midterm, just before COVID. Uh, the class began with the classical system. Uh, these students had all had classical mechanics. They should have known about coupled oscillators, masses and springs. So we did that first because that gave us a direct smooth on ramp into the finite difference approximation exercise on the pickup website is essentially the same problem. You're solving an eigenvalue eigenvector problem. Uh, this is mirrored in Griffiths, uh, one of their problems. So it gave the students two different looks at the same thing, which is something I thought was quite important. So what you're doing here in this uh, finite difference exercise, of course, is you're solving the time, the Schrodinger equation numerically, point by point, creates basically an eigenvalue problem. So we started again uh, with low end, just a few points that they could solve by hand. Um, and this was also done in uh, Griffiths. Then we sort of worked our way up through Wolfram Alpha, through Mathematica, and then we went to Python. And now we're into the finite, we're deep into the finite difference exercise set. Um, they, they solved the same problem over and over again so they could check the results. And then we branched out from that once we had the infinite square well worked out, uh, we, we started adding in potentials. We added in a sinusoidal potential energy from Griffiths. Then we went to exercise seven in the finite difference set and did the simple harmonic oscillator potential, which again reviewed something very fundamental from their theoretical work. Um, going forward, my students, both Tyler and Cullen, will uh, talk about some extensions. I'm not going to talk much about this. I'll leave that to the students. And before I turn it over to them, I'll just give you a quick summary of where we ended up. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, we did have dedicated lab sessions for this theory course. So we were able to focus on these activities. These ran independent of the lecture topics and in parallel. Uh, the student engagement was certainly enhanced by taking these theoretical constructs and having to code them. They had to really dig deep in to the theory. Um, the students, some of the students told me they felt like now they're creating something. They're not just uh, doing textbook problems. Nevertheless, uh, we did see, despite the fact that they all had previous computational experiences from other courses, there were inequities in the programming background. Um, and for us, because of our alternate year course rotation, this is an ongoing difficulty for us that we're still working on. How do we develop a uniform programming background. And of course, as I said before, they had a very inexperienced instructor. 
um, and that led to some inefficiencies along the way. Although we got through it, the students are quite patient with me and I thank them for that. Probably the uh, thing that, and I think some of us have seen this, there was some, on the part of some students a lack of interest or willingness to engage in some of these computational aspects. And I've seen this resistance to coding before um, in my electronics course where we do IDE programming. Okay, so with that, I'm going to get off the stage. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Tyler. Um, so I've got to get off, stop share. And I'd like to turn it over to Tyler Bennett uh, to discuss one of the uh, first extension that we did. Take it over, take it away, Tyler. Okay, let's see if I can get this right uh, here. That working? Started, but I, don't have uh, I think it's on its way. Okay, so. Uh, hi, I'm Tyler. I'm going to be a senior next year at St. Norbert in the physics department. And I'm kind of going to talk about my uh, unique solution in Python or more of an extension to the quantum dynamics in one dimension with a series solution on the pickup by Gardner Marshall. So kind of an overview of this exercise. It's a four year, you so have to Tyler, perform a four year. Can you minimize your participants yes. list or something? Cause it's oh, covering. Sorry. Yeah. Is that better? Not yet. Um, there. Yeah, there, there we go. We're good. All right. Um, so first, it's a four-year decomposition of a um, composite wave function in the infinite square well. And then it asks to recreate the wave function as a series of infinite square well stationary states. And then you generate time evolution and then animate the time evolution. And my thought process kind of started knowing I was going to animate it. So I started with how do I want to animate it? And because we had a given function, I found through a couple research uh, things that the funk animation was the best way I could, I thought I could do it to export a GIF. And uh, this is part of the map plot live in the Anaconda distribution. And in researching how to use this, I recognized that frames can actually be used as a method of iterating the time as uh, for the time evolution. So my whole code is kind of built on this. And first I needed to define a function rather than a uh, for loop in order to do the modulus squared of the um, of the wave function and the Fourier, the Fourier uh, um, constants. And then it takes two, two inputs, both position and time. And then to start animating it, another function had to be uh, defined that takes the input of frames and then turns it into a line that is um, able to be plotted and that line would be the modulus squared. And then that turns out with a little bit of uh, different finagling with uh, timing and everything. It turns out to look like a GIF kind of like this, which would be the time evolution of it. So Tyler, we are running a little bit short of time, so you could wrap yep. it up. So Colin, can yeah, I'm done. His project. Oh, okay, excellent. So uh, Colin, I guess if you could jump on. Awesome. All right. Um, All right. Uh, can you guys see my presentation? Not yet. No. No. Hmm. Oh, hold on. There you go. Okay. Got it. All right. Let me just. All right. So. Yeah, so uh, as Dr. Olson mentioned, my name's uh, Colin Voss and I'm, I'm a physics major at St. Edward College. And uh, I'm gonna be giving a quick summary of the work I did in Python, uh, compute the wave functions for an infinite square well perturbed by a delta function at the center of the well. All right, so first I computed both the unperturbed and perturbed wave functions and energies using the finite difference approximation. Um, and here's my code for the perturbed wave functions and energies where I began by modeling the delta function potential at the center of the well numerically. To do so, I uh, 
I filled an array with zeros everywhere except for the central entry, which I gave a value equal to the magnitude of the delta function potential spike given in the exercise. Um, and then I used the results of the finite difference approximation and the NumPy linear algebra package to construct the matrix for the Hamiltonian and determine the perturbed energies and wave functions. Then um, I used perturbation theory to calculate the expected perturbed wave functions. Um, perturbation theory tells us that the first order correction to the wave function is the sum shown here that depends on the unperturbed wave functions and energies as well as the first order correction to the Hamiltonian. With a case of perturbation by a delta function at the center of the well, the Hamiltonian correction takes the form shown here where alpha is the magnitude of the delta function potential spike. And then here's my code um, using perturbation theory. Um, in the first block of code, uh, I'm constructing the summation, which involves a few sine functions since we're dealing with the infinite square well. Then I calculated and normalized the exact infinite square well wave functions and added each exact wave function to the corresponding first order correction from perturbation theory in order to, to obtain the perturbed wave function. Um, so here's my result for, for the n equals one uh, case. Um, in this, this plot, uh, the black line uh, is the unperturbed wave function using the finite difference approximation. Uh, and the uh, cyan line there uh, is the perturbed wave function from uh, perturbation theory. And the red line, which is mostly covered up by the uh, cyan line, is the perturbed wave function from numerical metho methods and uh, finite difference approximation. Um, so, Colin, we're a little bit over time, uh, so if you could wrap up. The yeah, next just wrapping it up here. Yep. So, um, most notably, we observe a dip in the wave function at the center of the well due to the perturbation. Um, we also observe that the finite difference approximation result and the perturbation theory result agree very well overall, showing that the numerical method can handle the discontinuity of the delta function very well, which we didn't know going into this exercise. So, that was kind of interesting. Um, and as a final note, I've also uploaded my Python code uh, in its entirety and a more detailed version of my presentation, including the results for the energies. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, and our last speaker for this session is uh, Steve Cedarblom of Mount Union, uh, University of Mount Union. Um, and he's been involved with Pickup since he attended the Faculty Development Workshop in 2017 and has been programming since uh, back in the day on starting with his Radio Shack TRS-80. So uh, I'm sure that was a different experience than <laughs> Jupyter Notebooks. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to the questions for the last talk uh, in the panel session at the end, uh, just because we're a little bit behind. Also, I'm gonna be Colin and Michael and Tyler did mute. If you could mute your mics, that'd be awesome. Working? Uh, yes. I think once you go into presentation, then you should be good to go. All right. Okay. Look. Awesome. All right. So um, I wanted to do a uh, programming uh, exercise in an upper division uh, course, but one where the students don't have uh, any prior programming experience necessarily. So um, I picked the white curve of a variable star because um, I'm an astronomer, and there we go. So there's my abstract, you can read it later. Um, so I'm at uh, the University of Mount Union, which is a small school in Northeastern Ohio. Um, for most of my time here, our department had two people. Um, we have recently grown a little bit. We're up to four now. Um, we've had no, for the last, um, well, quite a while, 
we've had no computational course or any kind of like integrative plan uh, here. And uh, I am the old dog in the department, um, but I went to a pickup workshop a couple of years ago, I guess three years ago now. Um, I read through the AAPT recommendations and um, the pickup workshop, I went in hoping to actually kind of figure out a, some way of, of, of a, a plan for our department to use computation. Uh, that didn't quite happen, but I did learn a lot. Um, and one of the things I learned about was Jupyter Notebooks, um, which I had not experienced before at all. So the course that I'm talking about is uh, Observational Astronomy. It's an elective, so it's a small course. It's every other year. Um, and as I said, the prerequisites don't include any computational courses. In fact, the first time I did this, um, one of the students was a biochem major who was an astronomy minor. And he said his only experience with com computer science were um, conversations he had with a teammate on the cross country team when they were doing long runs at practice where they would just you know, tell each other about their majors. That was all he knew about computer science. Um, so I, I had to start from the ground level here. Okay, when we, the first time I did this, um, we're, we're meeting in a lab that has uh, Macs, um, and the students have access to the, that room outside of class time as well. Um, but um, now we have, um, well, obviously with uh, COVID, that doesn't happen now, but um, we have a, a recently a, a bring your own device initiative where the students are supposed to bring a computer with them um, to school. And uh, most, of the, most of the physics and uh, science majors, math majors have, have a, a computer. So that made it um, actually much easier to deal with this. And um, doing virtual meeting and uh, screen sharing um, was very helpful in terms of helping the students uh, actually write their code. Uh, someone brought up this question on Friday, why code at all? Um, and I think it's a, it's a good question to ask. I don't think there's a, a one-size-fits-all answer. Uh, sometimes it, it might not be appropriate to, to have students code in a particular class, um, but sometimes it is. Um, I, thought, I thought of a, a friend of mine uh, in college who was a chem major, and I remember the first time he got to use an NMR, and he came back to the dorm, and he was showing me this, this graph from an NMR and pointed to a... a a peak and he said that shows there's a, a hydrogen bond here and I said okay that's great what's this a graph of and he's like I don't know but that shows there's a hydrogen bond and uh, you know so sometimes that's all you need to know is how to use the how to use the uh, the computer but sometimes it's it's helpful to know a little bit more as well so I picked uh, Delta Cephei which is a periodic variable star uh, there's lots of archival data um, it's right there if you're interested. It's very bright uh, in terms of stars in the sky. It's uh, easily visible without a telescope. Um, and here's just some data. Here's the data that I used actually. I gave the students. And in astronomy, uh, our data is uh, very rarely evenly spaced in time because of things like weather, the rotation of the earth, you know, things like that. Um, so we have uh, unevenly spaced data and trying to find the period of that is the goal. So we're trying to find the period and then fold the data to find the light curve. So finding a phase um, throughout the period of, of each data point and then um, making a light curve of the, the brightness versus time. Okay, uh, one reason I like this project is because the students could actually also observe it themselves with small telescopes and analyze their images with um, free computational packages uh, like a Aperture Photometry Tool or Astro Image J. Um, so they got a chance to use a package that was all you know, slick and, and pre-made uh, for them. Um, but then I also had them add their data point in there and then uh, actually write their own code to, to do this. So they're using what's called the wam scargill periodogram, which you, you can actually find in packages um, already, but 
that kind of defeated the purpose for what I wanted here. So I gave them a paper. Um, now I didn't make them actually read the whole thing, but I, I let them read some of it. And the, the periodogram is based just on seven sums. Okay, we have to find this, this parameter tau hat, and then we're trying to find the, the power um, for different frequencies, angular frequencies. So we have this, this equation down there. So really all they needed to do was to be able to do some uh, sums and you know, division and addition and things like that. Okay, so I gave them a one page handout of basic commands and examples. And then we started with some very simple uh, scaffolding exercises. So we just started out with, uh, you know, here, here's how you deal with variables. Here's what you can do with, with some simple things with variables um, and how to output your, your results. Uh, we did plots and then loops. And that's, that's basically all they needed to do. So we did a few um, exercises to build up to that. And then I let them have at it. <clears throat> and debugging obviously is a is a big problem. Um, in the room that I was in the first time, uh, when they had <coughs> excuse me computers on you know at stations, I just worked on it in class and let them work on things, and then I could just pop around and and help debug. And actually, students helped each other as well. Um, when we're online, we went online. Um, we use Microsoft Teams and screen sharing to be able to see what people's code was was doing, what kind of error messages they were getting. And here's an example of what they get, a periodogram, and you can see the nice peak there. It turns out to be a period of, of just over five days. <laughs> and to make the white curve, they would take the number, of, they had to figure out the number of periods um, since a particular either maximum or minimum, whichever you want to pick as your as your starting point, and uh, then find the phase of that. So you're setting up all the uh, the points in phase, and here you can see the nice light curve uh, from all these different data points, including theirs. Uh, in the future, um, I I think uh, I would like to have some homework questions with some of the typical bugs for them to work on so that they get a little more used to looking for typos and you know missing colons and all those kinds of things. Um, that I think that would shorten up some of the time needed to, to get up to speed. And um, maybe using some kind of peer teams because the, when the students are working together and helping each other and looking at each other's codes, it seemed to really work well. Um, I, I tried I tried an online group thing with one of my uh, other courses and it, it did not work well. Um, but I think that was just because I'm the old dog and didn't really know how to how to run that trick yet. Um, so I'm hoping to to do that in the future. Um, and I also want to move this earlier in the semester and then add some subsequent projects that would use uh, some of those same you know plotting and and looping. Um, ideas to reinforce the ideas the, and the, the practice. Um, just trying to, to give the students the, the idea and the attitude that the computer can be used for um, a wide variety of, of uh, computational projects and problems, solving problems. And okay, so we are pretty much out of time. So uh, thanks to you for the next presentation. I think any questions that people have for you, they can ask. Uh, now that we're going to start the panel session. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if all our panelists uh, could maybe turn on their cameras uh, and then we can just go from there. Um, and of the participants, uh, if anybody has any questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A um, box. Um, so I guess there's one quick one that was, I believe, for Michael, um, where uh, Wolfgang uh, Christian asked uh, if the book authors, which here I'm assuming is Griffiths and Schroeder, uh, provide computational exercises independently of the textbook or um, or whether they're in the textbook or exactly. you know, what's header what. The exercises that I reference chapter and verse um, in my presentation and in, in these gentlemen's presentations are from the textbook itself. Okay. All right, cool. 
Yeah. So there are some computation in the new version of the Griffiths and Schroeder. Cool. There are some computational exercises. So there's more than some. There are a there lot. There are a lot. Of them, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah. I know Daryl. Yeah. I think okay. Been there a bunch. I, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and then for Steve's talk, uh, somebody asked, uh, "How did the students check that the frequency, the peak that they found, was actually the right one? Did you have them check against the literature or anything?" Uh, well, yeah, you can do that. Um, one of the things, if you have the wrong period your data, when you go to that white curve, it, it, it looks totally funky. It doesn't look like a, a nice ordered structured um, uh, graph or curve at all. Um, so if you, if you pick the wrong period, it's, it's pretty obvious. And you can actually also, the epic is, is either a, a minimum or maximum, whichever it's not always done the same way by astronomers. But if you, if you pick the wrong epic, also you see a shift and everything and it doesn't look it doesn't look right so mm -hmm. cool excellent uh there's another question uh asking about using uh i guess microsoft teams uh to video share and collaborate on programming so can students work on the same programming together or does each student have, kind of have their own program sitting in their room <laughs> uh, i don't know <laughs> like i said i i'm i'm really new to all of this as far as that goes um i i'm you can you can share your screen just like we've we've been doing here at this at this conference and so what i what i did was i would have the students work on something and then show me you know if they had a problem or they had something they were confused about they got some kind of results and they're like i'm not sure about this i would have them share the screen with me so i could look at it and and then if there was something um you know i could help them with and i would do that and like i said i would i would really like to figure out if there's a way to set up I, I, I'm, I'm assuming there is i just don't know how to do it but set up like groups um amongst the students so that they could share the screen with each other there might be ways also like you said to to be able to do like a google classroom type thing where you could both work on the same code at the same time um, i'm guessing that would be could be a little problematic though if you have two people actually typing at the same time yeah so i mean in my experience if you use uh google uh collab which is in the google suite and it's basically like yeah. your notebook two students can share the same document but only one of them can really edit it at a given time but the other person can share and at least you have somebody else watching overhead right. so that would right. allow you to implement some like pair programming yeah kind of yeah thing. um Cool. Uh, so, and, and since we're talking to you, Steve, uh, somebody asked, how long did it take for you to get through this project with the students from like, you know, they have no idea about coding or anything to like, here's the period at the end. Um, the coding part actually didn't take, uh, well, I guess it's a relative term, it didn't take that long. Um, we, we used um, parts of, I think, three class periods. Um, to do it. So I, I gave him a little bit, you know, to work on. We, we spent a fair amount of the first day just doing beginning programming and explaining, okay, here's what a variable is. Here's what a loop is. You know, here's how you get it to print and make a plot. Um, and then I let them work on it parts of, of a couple other class periods um, as well. Um, but since I also included observations and doing, you know, uh, image analysis of that of their observation that obviously added uh, time to the whole project. Excellent. Um, so there's another question, and this one actually goes for uh, Colin and Tyler. Uh, so, um, how did you like using computation in, in the course, and uh, how was that experience compared to just pen and paper problems? Or, you know, did you like it? Did you not like it? Well, obviously you two liked it because he asked you to present. <laughs> Um, so I really liked it. Uh, I think I'm a little biased because I, w coming into college, I wanted a computer science minor. I switched to math, but because uh, labs didn't work out. But I really enjoy working on the computer, and it also, um, looking at internships this summer, they really liked that I had had uh, experience in some type of coding language. Um, so that really helped i think and it makes you just feel like you're actually preparing yourself for what careers actually uh outside of academia want i guess 
What about you, uh, Colin? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I'm kind of same as Tyler on that one. I mean, I, I, I enjoy the computational stuff a lot, um, and I'm really, really glad we've been able to get more and more of that into our physics classes, um, you know, because I find it really interesting and challenging at times, and I like that a lot. Um, and also, you know, the fact, like Tyler said, um, from, you know, from what I've heard and what I've seen so far, I think that, you know, the computational stuff is um, how most of physics and engineering and all that's done now, rather than the pen and paper. So it's really nice to learn that. And it, you know, looks good on the resume and helps you prepare for your career. So yeah, I totally. liked it a lot. So it is currently 7.55, which is officially when we said we'd be done, but would the panels be okay with sticking around for a few more questions? Sure. Okay, awesome, cool. Uh, so just to kind of follow up on that, and maybe, if, and this is also for you, uh, Tyler and Cullen. So uh, Michael pointed out that some of your classmates weren't quite as hot on uh, programming and computational stuff as you two. Uh, in your opinion, or like from what you heard from them, what, what was the, the like, the not loving it part why didn't they like it if you know um for me i think a lot of it was the the learning curve can some if you don't have experience in any other programming language i come a little bit from programming in c it's not similar as python but you kind of get used to thinking how computers think and if you've never done that before the learning curve can be pretty steep and I think at least in the people that I kind of worked with, it's a uh, like the thing that helps the most is just reading. Um, and sometimes they're not willing to do that, just going through forums and you never know which one's gonna help you. Um, and there was a question on there that was asking about the, from Nathaniel Cunningham, asking about the funk animate thing and my, it being complicated and how I did it. I just went on the matplotlib forum and just read everything they had there. And they had some pretty good examples that kind of let me do the, um, figure out how to do the animation. Yeah, and um, for me, um, you know, I would say, I, I didn't actually do any kind of computational stuff or know any coding languages before. Um, last summer was when I first started doing it in my research. And um, I would say probably the biggest thing is that it's it's hard, you know, to to get a hang of it. You really have to put in a lot of effort and and work. And I think that can be something that a lot of people don't like if they don't if they haven't put a lot of time into it, to learning it and to uh, practicing it and get better at it. I think it can be really, you know, overwhelming. And if if you're not good at it, you probably don't enjoy it as much in class. So. I think that's a problem for a lot of people. Right, I can totally see it being like you submit an answer, like when you run your program, it crashes, you know it's wrong. And like, whereas when you submit an answer, pen and paper, you just turn it in and like if it's wrong, you'll get yeah. like a 75% yeah, on it. Yeah, it can get kind of, kind of annoying that well, way for, you know, um, so. There's a question for uh, Michael and Tyler and Colin, I guess, uh, about uh, when did these computational projects happen? Did they happen sort of throughout the semester or when you went online or? And I guess what challenges were associated with the online transition? Start with this, um, the the initiation of the computational work, which actually started on pen and pencil and paper with the classical system, the coupled oscillator system, which was a re, kind of a review to ideas to bring them into the eigenvalue eigenvector problem, started just before spring break. In other words, just before a pandemic, and they more or less had just finished that um, and submitted it, as I recall. And then went on spring break, and gentlemen, correct me if I'm getting my history wrong here, but I think you, I think you submitted the stuff for the couple oscillators just before spring break, and that was the last I physically saw these people. So the entire computation, okay, thank you, Tyler. The, the, the entire computational aspect was done online, so it was all done remotely. Uh... Okay, uh, there's a question from Brandon, uh, but I don't know exactly what he was following up on, but uh, were there things you found specifically challenging about this? So maybe we can open this to the panel more broadly. So you did computational activities during this whole COVID outbreak disaster. Um, what particular challenges 
do you see? And given that a lot of us are going to be teaching at the very least in some kind of hybrid mode in the fall, uh, what fixes do you think needed? I, I think for me, the biggest um, challenge was again, especially in these small, many of us in our small institutions, we have a lot of these opportunities throughout the day where we just encounter each other because we don't work in the same spaces and questions just sort of pop up in the hallway or you're going through the lab and says, oh, hey, Dr. Olson, could you just take a quick look at this? Sure, I can take a quick look at it. And then there's also the, the very convenient peer assistance and peer instruction that goes on when we're in face-to-face -face mode and everybody's studying in the same room or a couple of rooms and now you have to organize a Google Meet and you know bring people in and it's it, it's it's so it's, you lose that sort of just that convenient face to face quick back and forth and it just makes things more inefficient i think at some level uh, do you, any of the other panelists maybe uh, jay and sarnell i haven't really given you much of a chance to talk uh, do you, you have any any thoughts and now um, I think the main thing is that somebody mentioned debugging, debugging, debugging. Yeah, that's the problem. But if student gets stuck and can't get help right, it just is frustrating. And that's something you need to pay attention to. Yeah. For me, I found it um, very convenient using uh, MATLAB online because um, that um, allows me to actually see uh, immediately what the students are doing uh, the moment they change the code even if it's just changing one letter in the comments of the code i see it immediately updated on my uh, matlab drive so um, and i can go back because it has kind of like a like a google drive it has um, a long history it keeps all different versions of the code and i can go back and see what is they changed and how they think. But, but then again, um, debugging is, is a problem because I don't meet with them, like everybody said, face to face to explain to me what is their thinking because it's, everybody is different. Everybody finds a different implementation for the same problem. And <laughs> that's the most time consuming thing, trying to figure out how they figure out the solution and why it's working and why it's not working. That takes me the longest time to figure out their mindset, how they think of the solution. Uh, one thing kind of underlying all of this is uh, what resources you have. Um, you know, just the fact that Anaconda is free and you can do all those things um, and that it's, it seems I mean, even in the time, short time that I've been using it, it seems like it's gotten easier to install um, has been a really helpful thing because then the students can, you know, put it on their own computer and don't have to be in the classroom. Uh, when I started, we just, you know, we were meeting in the classroom and we had a, a lab with computers and I, just, I put Anaconda on it all and on all of them and, and I was kind of the um, IT person for that, but now they can they can do that. In fact, I've already emailed my astrophysics class for the fall to ask if they all have their own computers and what they have. And so I'm hoping that we can get get ahead of the curve and actually get that loaded on their computers before school actually starts. And so, and so following up on that, uh, so what if a student doesn't have a computer? What what are you going to do? <laughs> That's a good question. But if they don't have a computer, well, yeah, it, de it depends partly on how, what, what the, the actual plan for operating ends up being in the fall. Um, right now we're, we're scheduled to be kind of a hybrid um, where, they, where we do um, you know, so a, a flipped classroom essentially. Um, and in that case, when we actually have class meeting, um, or other times when the the lab might be available um, to them, they could they could go in and work on a on a machine in the lab. Okay, yeah, we we have some we're gonna have some loners, but mm -hmm. I don't know if it's gonna meet the capacity or not because nobody actually has taken I think statistics right. on how many students don't have computers. Right. Um, 
there was one question for Jay, uh, which asked how much of, of the scattering code did you have students code up or did you just kind of give them a code and play with, tell them to play with it? Yeah, um, I don't ask them to do this from scratch. Uh, we would actually talk about how to extract uh, the phase shift, for example. So you have a working code that computes with function of phase shift, okay? So that's the basic stuff. Then uh, they would say, be asked to calculate uh, the um, cross-section from this fish or compare the uh, field-free wave function with the actual wave function, like the graph I showed. Those are student work. And then from there, you can transition on to you know, some newer problems like cross-sphere, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, not enough um, time for them to do stuff from scratch. It would be a very big commitment, yeah, time-wise. Okay, uh, so does anybody else in the audience have any questions? Uh, if so, put them up on the Q&A thing sooner rather than later. Uh, or we'll wrap it up, call it a night. All right. Okay, it seems like- Thank you, Daniel. No, uh, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, let's thank all our speakers so we can do a clap. <laughs> uh, and uh, thanks, thanks everybody for the great talks.